Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, this is Have You Cake and Eat It. Um, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to event-driven architecture. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Ryan Townsend. I'm the CTO of Shift Commerce. Uh, we're a company based out of Leeds in the north of England. Um, so luckily, I flew over a couple of days early and, and avoided a lot of the weather problems that other speakers have had. Um, so what we do is we build a large-scale, multi-tenant SaaS e-commerce platform. Um, and our architecture is pretty important to us. Um, we, run a <laughs> we run a particularly large site. Uh, Matalan are a major retailer over in the UK. Um, they sell clothing and homewares. Um, they do about a billion in revenue, so that's the kind of scale that we're operating at. Obviously, this means that you know, our architecture in terms of our applications is really, really important. So just to get things kicked off, um, can we start with a show of hands? So put your hand up if you know what event-driven architecture means. All right, a few people. Um, put your hand up if you know what event sourcing means. It's getting a bit more technical. All right. Um, and put your hand up if you know what CQRS is. Great, cool. Um, so I've got a bit of an agenda today. Um, we're going to kick off with just an overview of what is event-driven architecture. So everyone who didn't put their hands up, you'll get the, uh, the overview there. Um, you know, why is this important to us? Um, what can we actually achieve? Um, you know, what's possible? Um, and then there's going to be some downsides. You know, it's not a silver bullet. It's not a perfect architecture. There's such a thing doesn't exist. Um, so I'll cover those downsides off. And then, like, how can we use it today? So I'll show you some live demos, hopefully, and they'll go well. Um, so you'll actually be able to see how we can even be using this today. Um, so you may have heard this quote before: "Data is the new oil." Um, so this has been said by pretty much every technology executive on the planet um, at some point or other. And basically what it boils down to is the fact that data is really important. Um, but like oil, it needs refinement. You know, looking at a bunch of numbers and a bunch of strings and other data isn't actually valuable. You need to refine it into something to understand what it means. Look at the intent of the data. The, you know, what does it represent? So if we look at a traditional database, it's just a snapshot of, of the current events, like what, what is happening right this second. Um, we lose a lot of the data behind how we got there. You know, if we look at life, you know, it's fluid. Things are constantly changing. Same thing with our database, hopefully. You know, if you've got a very active application, these things are going to be changing all the time. So actually, we could say that these things are a product of the events. So what you're looking into your, when you're looking into your database, you're actually looking at the result of all of these things that have happened over time. If we look at the real world, there's a whole bunch of things that this relates to. It could be financial transactions, it could be elections going on, it could be something as simple as people checking into and out of hotels. Um, and then there's a lot of knock-on actions. So you may have heard of um, the butterfly effect before. You know, can a butterfly flap its wings in Brazil and create a tornado in Texas? You know, all these things have a very, very minor impact in the overall state of, of the world and, and our database. So can we model our applications closer to real life? This is something that we try and do with our, our databases. We try and do it with our code. We try and make it really understandable by humans. So you know, is there any further that we can get? And that's really where event-driven architecture comes into its own. So there's a few kind of sections. Um, I borrowed this from uh, Martin Fowler. Um, there's a few different sections that event-driven architecture covers. It's kind of a wide umbrella term for a lot of different things. So you've got no notifications. So that's simply saying, hey, an event has occurred and telling other systems about it. Um, so an example of this could be Twitter's live streaming API. They're saying someone has tweeted and here's the contents. Um, it could be you know, a, a, an app notification or something as simple as that. Then you've got state transfer. So this is me saying, my service has changed something internally, and I'm going to let everyone else know about it so they can reference that state. Um, you've got event sourcing, which is effectively um, producing your end state based on those events. So that's a lot of what I'm going to focus on today. Um, and then you've got CQRS, which is, I, I will get into that, I promise. Um, but effectively, it's just a means of ensuring that your APIs um, and other technology kind of fit into this ecosystem. So why do we throw away all these events that happen in our application? We, you know, all of these things are happening, and we're throwing them away. This is something that accountants and banks have known for centuries. You know, it's even before computers, this was all happening. Um, you know, hopefully, if you took a look behind, your scene, behind the scenes on your bank account, they're not going to be doing something like this, where they're just simply incrementing numbers and decrementing numbers in people's accounts. 
So it's going to be a lot more like this. You're going to have an, a set of events that represent these transactions. You know, if you look at your bank statement, it shows that you know, you've sent money here, you've received this money. You know, so you've got this log of exactly what happened. Databases have even known this as well. You know, we have a transaction log in a lot of our database architectures, um, and that keeps a log of all of these commits that are happening, all the changes over time to our data. And in fact, Apache Kafka, which is an event streaming system, um, and we'll cover that a bit further on, um, actually describes itself as a distributed commit log, so that log of those events. So why is this, is, why is this a good idea? So this comes back to the, the title of my talk. You know, there's a, the, a common phrase, um, certainly in England, I don't know whether it's a global one, uh, you can't have your cake and eat it. Um, and what this basically means is you know, if I consume my cake, I can't then re-consume it, it's already gone, so I've got one benefit. You know, I can't consume it and then give it to someone else, um, and, they, and you know, they, they can't enjoy that benefit as well. Um, so with, with technology, typically it's something that you know, the business will really benefit from, or as, as developers, you know, if we get something that's you know, you know, really nicely refactored code, that's helping us, and it's a step removed from the business value. Um, whereas with event-driven architecture, you're getting a whole host of benefits that are directly related to the business. So, number one, you can build a better product. You have all this insight into what's going on in your system because you're tracking all of these different events going on. You can actually look at a pattern um, of, of interactions with your system um, and analyze that. So you can actually build you know, better features or you can put, put um, better um, performance optimizations in. You can even perform temporal queries where you query the system at a point in time. So you could go back and compare you know, how is the system acting today versus you know, three months ago. Um, if you have this entire event stream of, uh, of, of all these things going on, um, it, it looks very naturally like an audit log. So you, it's not something that you're bolting on at the end of a project. You're actually bringing that as a, into a, a core part of your system. Um, so you know, for, for businesses certainly that are, you know, operating at a larger scale, you know, auditing is, is a, an important piece of that. So it's something that you're getting out of the box almost for free just by using this kind of architecture. You can also replay that stream of events and actually fix the state of your application. So just say you had a bug. Traditionally, you'd fix some code, deploy that, and then everyone from now on doesn't get that bug. But what happened to all the people in the past? You know, that a lot of data may have got out of sync. You know, if you're doing reporting and things like that, those, those reports are now broken. So because you've got this, um, this set of events, you can replay those and regenerate the end result. Um, so you can actually fix your state rather than just the actual bug itself. If you're into microservices um, or just breaking down your, um, your big monolith into, into a few different services, um, you can actually decouple those um, with event-driven architecture. So I mentioned about that, that state transfer kind of um, concept. Um, that, that plays really well into, into microservices because you can pass that state. They can keep that locally, what they care about. They don't have to take you know, a copy of the entire database and then you've got schema changes and all those kinds of things. And um, they can take the state that they care about, the events that they care about, and act on those. And then finally, because you've got that, that state kind of shared across your system, um, what you can actually do is de-risk launches of new services because they can just listen on that event stream, handle what they need to in a read-only manner. So you can test the kind of throughput that you've got. You can test for whether there's any buggy events coming through, whether you've not handled an event when you should have. Um, and you can actually put something live into production, maybe behind the scenes, so you know, you're not just releasing it out to all your customers, but you can test that against your production stream. So to, to delve into this a little further, imagine you've got a, a cart system. You know, this is something very close to our hearts. So you have a database with line items, they have an item, and they have a quantity. This is how it would look in a traditional kind of CRUD application. Um, very basic. But we've lost a lot of the intent here. We don't know how the user got to this state. Um, so this is what really what we need. We need an event stream which has a set of events and then the actual parameters of what happened along the way. So we can see that this user, they added an iPhone to their carts. They decided they wanted two of them. And then they went, actually, you know, I'm going to give Google a go. Um, so they, they deleted the iPhone from their cart. They added one of the Google Pixels. Um, and then they decided, oh, actually, you know, it's a lot to spend on buying two at once. So you know, maybe I'll just buy one for now, and then I can consider another phone later. So you can see that a lot has happened along the way, but that was all lost previously. You'd have to do some sort of manual tracking, you know, hook up Google Analytics and things like that. But that will only ever happen from now. You've not ever got historical data that you can go back and analyze. 
So imagine you've got a bug. We've ended up here somehow. You know, the iPhones magically appeared in the carts. You know, um, the users reported a bug to us. Um, we know from the event stream that th that should have been removed, but for, for whatever reason, this has um, been problematic. So what we can actually do is identify the, the problem, fix the bug, deploy our code, and then we know that this, um, this row is the incorrect one. So as we replay our stream, it will automatically correct the state at the end of it. Um, so again, we've, we're fixing problems that have actually happened in the past, not just from now on. So just to cover the microservices side things in a bit more detail, um, I'm sure you'll have seen diagrams that look somewhat similar to this, um, where one service is calling another, that's calling another, that's calling another. So you may have a problem with what looks like the application on the far left-hand side, but actually it's, it's the one on the right that's causing the problem. And they're all calling one another. So you're delving through this indirection from one service to another, just trying to debug your system. With event-driven architecture, if you're following a stream and you've got that state that's, that's being populated amongst them individually, then you've got a very clear um, delineation between these services. They're not cross-talking. They keep the state that they need to access from others as a separate database. So that way, you know, if one of the services goes offline, yeah, OK, you might have a partial outage, but you're not taking your whole application down. Also, you're going to get better performance because you've not got this um, you know, multi-service calling. Um, it's literally a local database or a local data store of some kind um, that's storing that data. Um, and the, the resilience side of things doesn't just come down to you know, outages as well. It could be you know, during a deploy if you've not got a perfect zero downtime deploy, or there could be a, a bug with your deployment and that service is offline for a period of time. You know, this kind of um, scenario allows you to deal with those situations. And as I mentioned, you can introduce a new service onto the stream that none of the other services know about, um, that none of your clients know about, uh, that's just a read-only client to that stream. And that way, you can test that throughput. You can test those events coming into your system um, and actually prove that that's going to work effectively before you actually launch it out to the wider world. So um, I was at Dreamforce a couple of weeks ago, and my co-host on stage um, said this, this quote, um, which I think really, really sums up um, event sourcing and event-driven architecture really, really well. So it's an immutable time-ordered sequence of events um, that we use as our primary store of state. So that's our, our thing that we need to protect in the, in the system. You never change it. You know, it's ordered by all the timestamps, and that's one of the great things about Kafka is that it does um, enforce that as well. But it's not a silver bullet. It's not perfect for everyone to use. Um, you know, I don't, I don't believe there is a, an architecture out there that would work for every single application. So there's a few things that you've got to kind of cater for along the way. So first of all, you've got a synchronicity um, and eventual consistency. So this is more of a user experience side of things. So if you've got something that is just putting an event in the stream, just say it's someone adding an item to the cart, and then you've got an asynchronous process that's then persisting that into the database, if the user then reads their cart back, it could be a few seconds or a, or a little delay before that item actually makes it into their cart. So you need to use various different techniques, you know, maybe like a, an in-memory cache, for example, that stores that current state of that cart as those events get produced. Um, and then the persistence happens kind of behind the scenes. So you've got to cater for the fact that you know, the user is expecting their item to be in their cart as soon as they've added it. Um, so it's just you've got to be mindful of the kind of user experience that this brings. Um, next up, you've got um, corrections. You know, if you're making a change to something in the system, you can't just jump into the database, you know, make a quick change. You've actually got to have an event for that. Now, some of them, it'll mean that you can use existing events and just invert some values. So if we go back to the accountancy example before, it would be, you know, you could change the transfer 100 pounds to transfer minus 100 pounds. Um, but you lose a bit of the intent by doing that. So realistically, you, you do need to have a proper event that says, you know, transaction reversed or rejected or whatever it may be. So that's something that you've got to build in each time you want to undo something. Um, and as we replay that stream, um, we need to factor in our external systems. So you've got things like email notifications. You might have webhooks. Anything that's triggering out to external systems that you don't control, you don't necessarily know how those are going to act if they get that um, request ag again. So for anything that's not item potent, 
um, and just can accept that and go, yeah, I've already dealt with that, don't worry about it. You just need to be mindful, of, you know, if you're gonna replay these things, you probably wanna turn those off and not, you know, bombard your users with emails again. Um, if you've got a CRUD application, um, you, can, you, can, you can certainly bolt on an event stream to that. Um, you know, it's great if you, can, if you want to start breaking up a monolith, for example, something that we've been working on. Um, you can just start pushing events out to that system. Um, but if you, if you have both the event stream and your application using that to modify the state in the database, and then you have something else that just comes in and makes changes, the two are going to somewhat conflict with other, uh, one another. So the event stream doesn't know about these other changes that are going on in the database unless you tell it about it. Um, so You've just got to, be, again, be mindful of these things. So if you, if you start very basic, just you know, add an event stream, start pushing some events into it, and then you can introduce new services off that event stream, but you can't just immediately integrate it into a large application. And the final one's a bit of a misnomer. I'll put a little asterisk next to it. So demand on storage. Um, this is something that's catered for generally by Moore's law. You know, we get more storage at a cheaper price every single year, but ultimately you're going to be you're potentially storing trillions of events a day. Um, you know, um, Kafka's produced by LinkedIn, um, and you know they're producing enormous volumes of events every single day. Um, so for you to save all of those so that you can archive them and replay them at some some point, obviously that's a lot of data. Um, so what um, Kafka has is a rolling retention period. So you can set, okay, two weeks, and that's the, the date of time that I can replay within. After that, you can archive them somewhere. If you want to archive them, obviously, as I say, that's gonna be a demand on your storage, but it should be getting cheaper every year. So hopefully, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. So I'm gonna risk doing a live demo now. Um, I've talked for <laughs> quite a while. So um, does anyone here have Twitter? Hopefully. Quite a few, yeah? Um, so what I would like you to do is a bit of a contentious one. If you could tweet me, I'm at Ryan Townsend, with either Android or Apple, um, we can actually look at some, uh, some live streaming stuff coming in. So um, let me just drag this over here. Got to pray that this is actually connected and everything. Oh, the nickname, it's just up there at the top, so at Ryan Townsend. Oh, is it too small? Sorry, I do apologize. Where's my mouse? Is that a bit clearer? <laughs> okay, let's just refresh and see whether anything's coming through. Okay. Ah, <laughs> I do apologize for this. I've, in recording my demo, I actually turned off the, uh, the consumer. So that's booting up now. <laughs> so that'll be why nothing's coming through. Um, so um, let me just send a tweet out quickly and hopefully we can get some coming in. There we go. So you can see we've got tweets at the bottom and they're just streaming in. Um, this is unanalyzed, just everything that's coming in against my name, um, as long as it contains those words. And then we've got a pie chart that live updates with any um, values. Um, now what you may see here is that there's kind of a purposeful bug. So Apple have only got one vote, but actually it's come through as four. Um, so just to kind of demonstrate the, the, the kind of replayability of the stream, and um, what I can actually do is, uh, everyone's coming in for Android now, so hopefully they can catch up. Um, so we don't actually know what the, the real result is here um, because we've got a bug in the system, but we've got a log of all of those tweets, all of those votes, um, and we can actually replay that and rebuild the state to find out exactly um, you know, where we should really be. So what I'm going to do is, drag this window over, 
so for those who haven't seen it, this is Heroku. Um, and I have my Twitter consumer here, so I'm going to turn that off for now. This is what I did and forgot to turn back on again earlier. Okay, so we're not now not going to have any more votes coming in, so we can actually start to see what the real result is. Um, and then what I need to do is go and deploy my fix. I'm going to switch over to the Deploy tab. Yes. How's that? OK. Is that clear? <laughs> uh, there we go. Right. So right down here, I can do a new deployment. So I've already put the fix on master. So I can deploy my new branch. Hopefully, this won't take too long. Uh, but what this is going to do is just pull down the code, build it on Heroku, deploy it into um, Heroku, and just leave it like that. So I just need to run a, a couple of commands uh, once this is executed um, to replay through our stream. So hopefully this won't take too long. I'm not sure the Wi-Fi is the strongest. There we go. So this is, this is executing at the moment. Um, let me just bring up my terminal window. Okay. So the first command I'm going to run is Heroku run fake reset buts. So what I'm going to do first is just simply wipe the database. Hopefully I got that right. I can't see it on my screen, so. OK, great. So if we switch back to the poll now. This should come through as empty now. So we've, we're back to a blank slate. And now what we can do is actually replay that stream. So Heroku, I'll just change the current command. So I built a replay. Oh, not our play. And again, what this is going to do is simply take all those events that occurred replay them, and then we should get an accurate result out of the back of it. So you can see this is processing all of those tweets from an archive. And in the backgrounds, we can see that this is live updating with those broadcasts. So we can see that actually it came out as Apple 3, Android 5. So Android won in the end, even though Apple was cheating. So just to describe what's going on here, um, it's quite a um, extensive architecture behind this. I've kind of um, blown it way out of proportion just for something as simple. Um, but this kind of demonstrates um, event streaming very, very well. So what we have is we have Twitter, which is kind of depositing tweets into our event stream. Um, those are then analyzed um, for what they're voting for um, by a, a consumer. And we then also have a broadcaster, which sends things up to Pusher, and then that pings it out into um, the bottom of that um, demo screen. Once the votes have been analyzed, they then get consumed by our broadcaster, which sends them again onto Pusher. Um, and those go live into the live chart. And then in the background, we're persisting those into Postgres. So if we refresh that screen, we'll get the latest view at any time. So how we replayed that was just an additional um, consumer here. Um, so we had an archiver on the side of that, uh, which took all of those messages, whether they be tweets or votes, and persisted those into Postgres. Now, those could, that could be into another system. Um, it could have just used Kafka and replayed the last um, two weeks or something like that. Uh, but this was the, the easiest way to kind of demonstrate this stuff. So onto event sourcing and CQRS. Um, so for those who aren't aware, CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. It sounds really, really fancy. It's not something that is directly linked to, uh, is not required for event sourcing, but it's the kind of thing that's 
goes hand in hand typically. Uh, what it all really just boils down to is simply your, the, the interface to read information will be different from the way that you tell it to mutate that data. So you submit a command in, in one format, that might be you know, create blog post or um, you know, submit review or whatever it may be, add an item to cart, and then the interface to read that data is entirely separate. So there's no, no joining um, between the two. There might be some overlap, um, but generally they're gonna be separate interfaces. And what this means is that we have the intent of the user captured in that command. So we know exactly what they wanted to achieve, and that can go into our event store, um, and we can actually use that event to then update our state. So when someone submits a query, it's reading from that, that end state, um, but when someone's um, processing a command, what they're doing is actually creating an event behind the scenes. So if you use REST APIs, you may be familiar with something along the left. Um, so you know, an update to line items, um, you know, again, using the cart example. Now, this could be an update to either quantity. It could be someone submitting like a custom design for a t-shirt against that item. You know, maybe you're running something like Sticker Mule or something like that. Um, but we don't know what that is. Um, so one pattern, you know, I mean, you can use REST kind of with CQRS, um, but one thing that we've been doing is literally using our URLs um, to, to match the exact command that people are performing. So again, that gives us specific methods that show the intent of the user, so we really know what they're trying to achieve. If anyone's um, particularly advanced here and has been using um, GraphQL, uh, mutations is a, is a fairly new concept within GraphQL, um, and they're basically CQRS. So you're submitting a very specific payload that's saying, create me a review, and you know, this is the stars and this is the commentary about that review. Um, so you know, that interface, compared to reading the review, reviews, is an entirely separate one. So we know exactly what our users are trying to do here. So in the next demo, I'm going to be using Apache Kafka. Um, to give you a bit of background about the kind of tooling, so we've covered off the, the kind of API side of things and how you consume those events, but then how you store them. Um, Kafka is, a, is a, a particularly great system for doing this. Um, and um, effectively, it was built by LinkedIn. Um, I think it was open source back in 2014, so it's a couple of years old now. It went 1.0 just a couple of weeks ago, um, so it's a really, really stable system. Um, obviously, to handle the likes of LinkedIn's traffic, um, you know, they need it to be. Um, it's really, really fault tolerant and robust. Um, I believe that most setups will um, broadcast any event out to multiple, they call them brokers, um, and that, that effectively has that replication built in for you. Um, there's different de uh, deliverability guarantees around those messages, so you can say each system should receive it at most once, not commonly used. Um, you could say at least once, that's generally the most popular, and then they've just introduced exactly once, but as far as I'm aware, that's not actually truly exactly once. I may be wrong, um, but it's not 100% guaranteed. Um, it's a very, very tricky problem to solve. Um, also, um, we mentioned before about having this time-ordered list, and that's something that Kafka enforces. So you have multiple topics within Kafka. Um, before, we saw tweets and votes. Those were two different um, topics, effectively. Um, so the messages within those topics and within a kind of partition within those um, will be in a specific time order, and there's a guarantee around the way that those are delivered. So you can ensure that everything in that stream is going to come through in exactly the same way um, every single time. Um, and finally, in terms of your consumption of those events, um, you actually pull them down from the consumer. Um, so that, that way, um, you can deal with bursts in events. So if you've got systems that are susceptible to spikes in traffic and things like that, um, users that are going to be coming in for like flash sales or something like that, um, then you can handle that. You know, Kafka will act as like a, a buffer almost. Um, so you only, your systems are only pulling down the events that as they can process them as quickly as they can do that. Um, so if there's any problem with them um, you know, in terms of the amount of throughputs, and they're simply just not going to pull down as much. Um, we've been using Kafka on Heroku, so we talked about you know, how can we use this stuff today. Um, I promise they haven't sponsored me to say anything about them. This is, I'm just really um, happy with their products. So if you want to get started with this stuff, this is probably one of the easiest ways to give it a go. Um, 
Uh, Heroku have just introduced uh, multi-tenant plans, so from $100 a month, or, you know, and you, and you build, I think, minute by minute. By minute. Um, so for a cost of a coffee, you can play with this stuff for a day. Um, so the plans start only $100 a month. Um, you get instant provisioning, so you literally click a button, pay some money, and you're, and you're live. Um, and that's not like a temporary instance that's going to be you know, unreliable or anything like that. You're getting high availability out of the box, even at that kind of scale. Um, it's really easy if, you, if you're going to try out the kind of microservice architecture using Kafka. Um, it's really easy to share access to that system across your applications. They handle everything from all the kind of provision of SSL communications and you know, access credentials and all that kind of stuff. And um, that's all wrapped up in their configuration. Um, so you can simply attach Kafka to another application. That's something that I'll demo in my second demo. Um, and, you, and you're good to go, really. Um, and then the final one is just that they have a really thoughtful developer experience. So you can do things like, even before you've got an application, you can write messages into the stream. You you can tail the stream and, and listen for the messages that are being um, processed through it. Um, and you can even like, set up all your topics and everything from the command line. Um, so you know, they really thought about the tooling around this stuff. So this next demo is based on Kafka. If you want to check it out, it's at C17 um, for Code Europe, um, dot Heroku app dot com. Um, basically, this is just a little e-commerce application. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll bring that up on the screen. So this is the application. Um, let's just bump up the size a little bit. So what we've got here is just a simple miniature e-commerce site. You've got different books. You can add them to cart. You may have to switch to the recording for this one. Doesn't look like the Wi-Fi is uh, having a good day. So, where's my desktop? Here we go. Here's one I made earlier. So, as I say, what we've got here. Hopefully, some of you guys can access this on your phones. We've got an e-commerce site. Um, and I'd say what you can do is add items to your cart. You can change the quantities. Um, you can remove items from your cart. And you can place orders, ultimately, at the end. Um, and again, what this is doing behind the scenes is we've got very specific um, endpoints. And this is outputting our events into Kafka. So that was just tailing it on Heroku. And then ultimately, you can place an order at the end of it. So you. You know, presented with an order ID. Obviously, this isn't particularly useful, but um, I didn't really want to be collecting people's information during demos. So we have another system. Um, so this is tailing the stream. Um, and this is producing our order report. And um, what this is actually showing is the fact that, again, we had a bug. Um, so this demo was also showing how we can replay that stream um, and get to the correct end result at the end of it. Um, so I'll just skip through this real quick. Where's my mouse? So you can imagine that our e-commerce site has grown to an enterprise scale. We're, you know, we're years in the future, and we don't want to disrupt the capturing of those orders. Um, but our, our manager has come to us for a new report, um, and they want to be able to analyze how people are interacting with the cart. Imagine you're on something like um, Amazon. You, know, you filled your cart with items, and then you, you look at the total and go, it's, I can't really spend this amount of money on myself today. Um, I'm going to have to you know, reduce um, some of the items. So you get rid of some of the items, and you place your order. Now, to Amazon or to, to any business running a similar site, that's lost value. Effectively, you know, someone was showing intent that they wanted to purchase something, and it ultimately didn't. So what they can do is remarket to those people. 
Um, you know, they could they could publish out an advert that says, "Hey, you're going to get 10% off this. Just use this code." Um, so people can feel a little less guilty about buying those items. So imagine that you know someone's come to you and asked for that. Now traditionally, you then go, "Okay, well, you know, we don't really log people removing this from the cart. So I'm going to have to then go add that logging and you know, and then push that into some system that then can give us the report." Well, we have that data because we have our event stream. So what we can do is deploy a new application. Um, so again, this is using Heroku. Um, so we can deploy an application in isolation separate from all of the others on the stream. Um, so we don't have to be worried about disrupting this massive application that's processing thousands of orders a, a minute or something like that. Um, and all this is going to do is read off that stream and produce our report. Oh, this is the correct one, yes. Um, so this is using the, the Heroku button, which allows you to kind of set up an application uh, really, really easily. Um, again, it's just building. I don't know whether this happens pretty quickly. Cool. Um, so this is going to be able to, to demonstrate how quickly we can attach um, Kafka to this. Um, basically, it's just as simple as um, connecting uh, the, the, the add-on onto this new application, and it's going to propagate all access credentials over to it so it can now access it. Um, in terms of um, any further setup, all we're going to have to really do is create some consumer groups. Um, so what Kafka has is the idea of um, a consumer, so that's reading your, um, your event stream and processing the events in a particular way. But if you want to scale that out, obviously you're going to need multiple of those processes. So you do, what you don't want is the same um, consumer processing those events time and time and time again. You know, if you had 10 running, they could all end up receiving the same events. So you have the concept of um, consumer groups, which allow you to tie these together so no two consumers are going to receive the same um, events twice. Um, obviously, it does happen from time to time. Um, you do have um, you know, the, the, the kind of deliverability model that you've chosen. So if you've said at least once, then occasionally you might get consumers um, consuming the same event twice effectively. Um, but that's just something that you've got to cater for in your application. So I think I can just fast forward through a little bit of this. Um, OK, so our application's been built. Um, and now what we can do is switch to um, our other instance. Um, that actually has Kafka attached to it. And then it's as simple it appears, um, as clicking a button to attach to another application. We select our new application. And then that's, that's as much as the configuration is to share that Kafka instance between those two applications. So we can switch back to our main one. And we can now see that we've got Kafka running on there. Uh, you can see that our consumers are currently turned off, just because I need to set up the, um, the consumers on the command line. Again, kind of fairly straightforward commands to run. So this just allows us to coordinate. You know, if we were running, you know, 20 different cart consumers, um, you know, they're all processing cart interactions. Obviously, we don't want to be doubling up on um, people's uh, items and things like that. And then finally, it's just a case of booting up those consumers. Um, and effectively, they will go back to the start of the stream. So they'll go back to up to two weeks ago in this instance. And they'll be reprocessing all of those events. Um, so all we're doing here is just checking the logs to ensure that maybe I had an error when I was <laughs> um, recording this version. Um, oh, there we go. Um, so this is going back and, and playing through all of those events. Um, and then ultimately, we're going to get the report out the end of it. So hopefully, when we open that, we should be able to see that certain people had actually placed an order, but actually removed a few items. So you can see that here we had um, 11 seconds before someone placed their order. They actually added lean start. They had lean startup in their um, in their cart, and then they removed it. So we can actually. Um, market to these people now and say, hey, maybe you want to come back. You know, lean startups on on special offer. You can feel a little less guilty about it. It's half price or whatever, um, and we can target these people. Obviously, we just got cart IDs here. As I say, I didn't want to be collecting everyone's information, so this is a, a kind of very basic example. But you can you can take this um, a lot further. So 
So, hopefully, I've given you enough of an overview now for you to be able to say, I know what event-driven um, architecture means, I know what event sourcing means, and I know what CQRS means. So, thank you for everyone attending. Um, if anyone has any questions, I think we've got, I don't know, yeah, we've got about 10 minutes for any questions that you guys might have. I think we've got a microphone, so if anyone wants to um, speak up, then uh, please come and use that. Thank you.